This is my disclosure slide because I was late and it didn't end up in your book. So, so what I'd like to talk to you about is therapy. And uh, when we talk about sequencing things, we have to look at what's available in the toolbox. What do you actually have to be able to use? And in this uh, disease of follicular lymphoma, we typically divide things into low tumor burden and high tumor burden and a relapse. So when you start to think about this disease, you, you really realize why you did internal medicine before you did uh, became a hematologist or an oncologist, because you really have to look at the whole patient. And you have to, as I'm going to show you in a minute here, it depends on a lot on the age and the comorbidities of the patient as to what you're going to choose and how you're going to sequence these therapies that we've all heard about in the last day or two. We have to look where the patient has symptoms. And remember, if the patient feels normal, there is no way you're going to make them feel any better with any treatment that you give them. And so you have to look, I think, uh, uh, sometimes this is a very long discussion with the patient that I find where you're really deciding whether to watch and wait or, and it's a real struggle for some patients to decide exactly whether they want to even take treatment and what type. So what therapies do you have in the toolbox to sequence? Uh, if you look at the watch and wait patient, as just described by Dr. Coleman, you have observation, rituxan, and I'm going to throw in a different kind of radiation called radiometherapy. For the patient with high tumor burden, we're basically today looking at three recipes, bendamustine rituxan, uh, R-squared, which would be lenalidomide rituxan, or r -chop. In the relapsed patient, uh, typically these patients are considered, if they're young, especially if they've transformed for salvage therapy uh, with or without a transplant. And there's three regimens listed there that are very commonly used that you all use yeah, as salvage chemotherapy, nothing new there. Uh, radiometherapy is FDA approved for this indication, lenalidomide or brutinib uh, and idelisib, and I think some of that will be covered under the novel agent discussion later by Dr. DeVos. So again, what do you need to know now to choose your sequence? Uh, first of all, there's some things you can get at baseline to start to decide what do I choose first. And I'm gonna show you, as has already been hinted at, there's a little duplication here today because I've heard some of these same slides, but you're gonna know a lot more about your patient in one to two years. And we don't have to wait anymore for uh, five to 10 years to know how these patients are typically gonna do. Now this is a, a data from our uh, upper Midwest, what we call the molecular epidemiology database, and it's also validated with a French database. And what this shows, I think, is really important for you to understand that if your patient is sitting there with newly diagnosed follicular lymphoma and they're over 60, like me, they are gonna live out their life with the same life expectancy. They may live with their lymphoma, but they're, not, they're gonna die at the same rate as anybody else, at least up in the middle of the heartland of, uh, of the United States and in France also. However, if you look on the left, you can see the black curve, the follicular lymphoma survival for the patients under the age of 60 is slightly lower. Not much, but it is lower than a patient who is otherwise not known to have any cancer. Now, all of these three major studies, the uh, Ali Press study on the left, the Rommel study that's been referred to of BR versus RCHOP, and the one from uh, Dr. Salas, all show that in the first two years, there's this kind of steep drop off. And this is what you've been hearing today about this 20% of patients who fall off the curve in the first two years. And then you see these curves kind of level off and there's this drifting down over the years. So it's very hard to tell a patient you know, what's going to happen 10 to 15 years. But if you could determine what's going to, who that 20% is, those are the ones we really want to focus on. And so again, going back to the paper, this is not yet published. This is, um, this is abstract last year at ASH. But again, if you, if you look now and you say to your patient, okay, I'm seeing you for the first time. I don't know how you're going to do. I'm going to use my flippy score. I'm going to use all the things I can to try to predict. But if you come back and see me in 12 months, I will tell you even more how you're going to do. And so on the Upper curves on the top there are patients who were observed. And you can see that on the left, upper left, those patients who achieved an EFS 12, in other words, 12 months later from the time they were diagnosed, they were still, uh, had not progressed, those patients lived the same as the red curve, which is the upper Midwest standard Minnesota, Lake Wobegon type patient, okay? On the other side, if those patients who were observed did not meet EFS 12, in other words, they relapsed in the first year and they, or they started to need treatment. You can see they do a little worse than the red curve. The most important curve on this is the one on the bottom uh, right with the big arrow there. Those are the patients who got BR or they got RCHOP 
In other words, rituxan-based chemo and chemoimmunotherapy, and they relapsed in the first year. And you can see their overall survival is markedly worse than the standard population. So you'll know in the first year when you see your patient back how they're going to do and whether they're going to be one of your patients long term or whether they're going to be in trouble. And so this, I think, is a very important new biomarker. It's going to be built into our trials because we no longer have to wait 10, 15 years to, to look at how our patients are going to do. We can say we tried our new agent and what was the EFS-12 with that new agent and that will predict their long-term survival. And this, uh, this study is already printed. Uh, this was a national lymphocare study. We also participated in this. Uh, it's been mentioned by Jonathan. This shows a similar thing. It used the two-year mark and you can see those patients who progressed in the first two years after an RCHOP-like reference or, or treatment rather it did much worse. The blue curve does much worse than those in the yellow curve, which uh, did not progress. So these are powerfully, pretty easy, obviously easy uh, biomarkers to, uh, to be useful. Now you say to me, okay, that's nice, but I don't even want to wait a year. I don't even want to wait two years. I want to know now. I want to have foresight as to how my patient's going to do. And this is what Randy was referring to earlier today because this molecular-based FLPI score, the M7 FLPI, uh, which has the, the nanostring gene sig uh, mutation signature in there along with the FLPI score, is, as you can see on the red curve, when you combine those two, the red curve on both sides, those people that have, where you're combining FLPI with the genomic signature, you can pick out those patients who are gonna go downhill and relapse. Now, these are relapse curves. These are not overall survival curves, but, but they, they will help you figure out who's gonna likely relapse in the first two years. So maybe we have a, a way of finding those people at time zero based on an analysis type this. So what I've told you so far is at the time you see the patient, and you're choosing your sequence here, uh, you have your FLPI2 score, the beta-2 microglobulin, the LDH, which we haven't gone into. Age is going to help you 60 or less than 60. Wait 12 or 24 months, you'll have a better idea of how your patient's going to do. Now, will this new score that Randy described help you choose those 20%? It looks like it might. Now, the other problem is, of course, is we don't know, even if we can find those patients and we do something different with them, and we don't know what we would do different right now, it may not make any difference. I mean, those of us who've been in this business for 30 years, I, I mean, we can pick out some of the bad patients, but we haven't always been able to do anything about it. So this is going to be our challenge. We may be able to find the 20%, but will we be able to change and bend that curve upwards? We'll see. Now, when we get back to treatment now, we have all this data. We're going to choose our sequence. Uh, we're going to go back to using some old uh, data, and this is called the GELF criteria. You can see that's a 1997 publication. It's referred to now, you'll of, of, often hear it uh, spoken about as low tumor burden, and this is the definition of that. It's pretty... Uh, pretty obvious, you know, no symptoms, uh, not a lot of big nodes, no big spleen, no compression of a ureter, uh, and uh, good blood counts. So if you have a patient now that you've done the staging and they have low tumor burden, you have three options. You can observe them, as Dr. Coleman has talked about, you can, and you can do that without risking their overall survival. We sometimes call that watch and wait. We sometimes call it watch and worry. This is where some patients can't handle that. They go, doctor, you just told me I have stage four cancer and you're not gonna treat me? I don't like that, I'm gonna go see Dr. Leonard. And they go across town and they get a different opinion and they go around until they find something that works for them. So you have to talk to them and you have to explain. It's different than breast cancer, it's different than pancreatic cancer. A number of articles now, we have an NCCDG study, the Columbot study, the Ardeshna study, the ECOG resort study, all show that rituximab times four doses without maintenance gives you very high response rate, 75%, and some of those patients are 10 years out and they've never relapsed. The last thing is radium and a therapy. There's now uh, several publications, several of those, those two at the bottom there are ones, you'll have these slides by the way in your, in your uh, PDF. Uh, those are recent publications using radium and a therapy uh, up front. Now, th this is an old drug that I would call a niche drug. It's one that is useful, it has a very high response rate, and I just want to bring it to your attention because I think a lot of people forget about it. But the one on the upper left, ibrutumumab toxin, is the only one on this page that is currently clinically available. And what this is is basically rituxan, except it's the murine parent of rituxan. It's got a hitch on it, which we call tiaxatan, and on the day you treat the patient, you put a little yttrium-90, a beta-emitted radioisotope on it. 
And this is very easy to do. You do it with two doses of rituxan, one dose of the ibrutumumab on day eight, and that's all you do. It's one week of treatment. And the advantages of this is that's it. It's one and done. It's outpatient. There's no hair loss. The only side effect of this is really a myelosuppression, and it has a very high response rate in the 90% range in this group of patients. Now, that 90% figure that I just quoted you is based on this study from Dr. Kaminsky, which is now 10 years old, and I really hope he updates the survival of this because this is an important paper. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine. He found by giving a single dose of Bexar at that time, this was the iodine antibody. Now, all of these patients weren't the, weren't the ones I just told you about. There were some GELF, he doesn't put it in there, there so some GELF patients in there along with non-GELF criteria, but be that as it may, a high response rate, high CR rate, and about 60% were still progression-free at uh, five years. Now, the other important thing out of this, there's been no MDS in this series, except for one case, which got MDS later after the patient had been transplanted. So giving radium therapy up front has a very low risk of, of hurting your bone marrow. Now, switching to a high tumor burden, I think your options are pretty clear. You're going to give the patient rituxan-based chemotherapy, and I think most people around the United States are going to be using bendamustine rituxan. The current uh, protocol in the nation, there is no national study right now for, for newly diagnosed high tumor burden uh, follicular lymphoma. That, the ECOG study 2408 was just completed a couple months ago, and it's, uh, we're waiting on the results of that. Now. Is bendamustine better than our CHOP? And this is the Rummel study that Dr. Coleman referred to. As you can see, it is better. This is a progression-free survival curve. You have to go to the Lancet Oncology supplemental website to see this curve. This curve shows no difference in survival. So you get, it's a little nicer regimen. Uh, like Dr. Coleman said, it can be myelosuppressive, just like our CHOP is. But you're telling your patient, I can't promise you this is going to be any better for overall survival, but it is better uh, up front for producing responses. Now, this was the ECOG study. I just want to show you, you can't put anybody on it anymore because it's closed, but this was all BR-based except one arm had Velcade for induction. Everybody got two years of rituxan maintenance. We're going to hear the debate about that in a minute. But in this study, everybody got two years of rituxan, and one arm got R-squared, lenalidomide rituxan. So this is going to answer two questions. Does adding Velcade up front help? and does adding a year of Revlimid afterwards help. Now the other regimen you need to know about is R-squared, Revlimid or lenalidomide rituximab. And this was the Fowler study, and this is, uh, I'm just gonna show you the follicular data, which was, there was 50 patients. This was published in Lancet Oncology last year. Notice the dose of lenalidomide, it's a little bit less than the myeloma dose. It's got rituxan with each cycle. There were six cycles, you could go up to 12, but no maintenance after that. Very high response rates in all the patients. Look at the folliculars, 98% response rate. You can't do much better than that with a very high complete remission rate and a uh, high PR rate. Now, however, notice, this is why you need to know the GELF criteria because in this table we see that only half the patients met the high tumor burden for GELF. And so you have to look at these studies and say, were they looking at a watch and wait population or were they working at, a, at people who really needed treatment? And you can see here they mixed them up a little bit, and that's what often happens in these follicular studies, which makes it a little harder. But look at these curves. I mean, these are really good. This is an overall survival. This is time to progression. And uh, we'll see how that curve, if it holds up and goes over here, or whether it gradually goes uh, down like many of the other curves do. This is the relevance trial, which I believe is done, and it was randomized R squared versus BR. So that would be the next question, wouldn't it? Does it do better if you add... Uh, if you compare it to the, to the bendamustine rituxan. So we'll see how that turns out probably in a year or two. So we've addressed the question about our chemo being the standard in your sequence. You can take your, your choice, but for a patient who needs chemo, typically it would be BR. BRs is good or better than our CHOP without a survival benefit. Rituxan maintenance for two years is consolidation as per PRIMA or RIT per FIT, which I have not showed you. Our FDA approved options but do not impact survival and are waning in use, although maybe we'll hear something different from the debaters in a little bit. At our place, we don't routinely give a rituxan maintenance or uh, radium therapy after BR or our CHOP. Uh, the unanswered questions is, is the R-square maintenance better than just R alone? Uh, 
Can this upfront RIT that I showed you for that watch and wait group cure some patients? We actually have a trial that just opened where we're randomizing that population to a single dose of Zevlin versus four doses of Rituxan to, to actually compare that. And lastly, can the R squared that I showed you beat BR in an upfront pop, uh, population? Now for the relapse population, I just want, I think some of this will be covered by other speakers. I just, uh, uh, this is where you get into uh, individualizing your treatment again. And I, I would just show you one slide that I think is the way I kind of think about it is when you see your patient back for relapse and you're thinking about, now what do I do in the sequence? You obviously have to think what you gave them the first time. You have to know how long did the response last the first time? Was it that patient who relapsed in the first year? If it's a rather indolent relapse, low bulk, no symptoms, a very long time to progression, no evidence of transformation, and a normal LDH, that's a great candidate for FDA-approved Zevlin. You know, that kind of patient will do well with that. You could give them the same chemo you gave them before if they had a very good bang from it the first time. You could give them a protocol therapy, obviously, and you could just simply give them Rituxan. If, however, this patient looks like they're transforming, you're going to re-biopsy, you might consider that patient for a transplant after giving them salvage therapy, and that would be the typical route to go for that patient. Uh, these drugs are the new ones, and I'm almost sure they'll be talked about later, so I'm not going to uh, talk to you about them. We heard over lunch about Idelisib, which is FDA approved for, for relapse follicular lymphoma. So in summary, you have to know your patient before you pick the sequence. Don't overtreat. You give that last cycle of bendamustine, and that's when the counts really go down. You just would love to take that back. Don't overtreat these patients. RIT is an important, I would call it a niche agent for, niche agent for the early patient or the first relapse. The later you use it, the more banged up the marrow, the harder it's going to be to give radium and therapy. I've talked to you about the markers EFS 12 and 24, the M7 Flippy. And I think the new trials you're going to see in the cooperative groups coming are going to use these and molecular markers to try to find this 20% and make life better uh, for them. Thank you very much.